So welcome to the Museum of Science, home of the William and Charlotte Bloomberg Science Education Center and the National Center for Technological Literacy. I'm Yanis Miaoulis, President and Director of the Museum, and on behalf of the Board of Trustees and Overseers, I'm pleased to welcome you to all this very special event. I see none of you could get World Series tickets either, because you are here tonight. And uh, please begin your first course as we have a very full evening, so you please go ahead and eat as I'm, I'm speaking. At this time, I would like to thank our six Summiteer sponsors, Eaton Vance, Mo and Stacy Cowan, Gretchen Fish, Lars Foundation, Michael and Susan Thonis, and Gul York and Paul Meter. Thank you all. My thanks to all of our table sponsors. And as you know, this is a fundraising awards event. Through ticket sales and sponsorships tonight, who have helped us raise over $135,000 for the Museum of Science. So this is just terrific. <laughs> it is also important to recognize support in all its forms. Tonight, we're honored and grateful to welcome those members of our staff who have had 25 years or more of service at the museum. So please stand and be recognized. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for all your amazing dedicated service to the Museum of Science. Tonight we present the 54th Bradford Washburn Award. In 1964, a museum trustee made an anonymous gift to establish and endow the Bradford Washburn Award. In doing so, he gave the Museum of Science two great gifts. The first gift is the ability to bring some of the world's leading scientists, authors, inventors, explorers, teachers, researchers, educators, and broadcasters to the museum for a special evening that engages in and invigorates our community every year. The second gift is the opportunity to honor the legacy and achievement of our founding director, Bradford Washburn, each year at this awards ceremony. And uh, when uh, Brad and Barbara were alive, they would come to this event, and we had seating arrangements like we have today, and they would come, Brad would decide where he's going to sit. And you can imagine the confusion trying to shift tables when Brad decided I'm going to sit on this table or that table. But we miss them both, both dearly. The Bradford Washburn Award recognizes individuals who have made outstanding contributions toward the public's understanding and appreciation of science and the vital role it plays in our lives. Among the exclusive Washburn Award Club are Oscar and Emmy winners, journalists from the New York Times, Scientific American and National Geographic, multiple winners of Pulitzer's and Peabody Awards, Guggenheim Fellows and educators from MIT, Cornell, Tufts, and Harvard, including Nobel Prize winner George Wald in 1967. Terrific group. Also joining us tonight are Brad's daughters, Betsy Washburn Cabot, who always comes to this event. It's great to see her again, who serves as a museum overseer, and Dorothy Duncas. After dinner, we will present the 2018 Washburn Award to our very special honoree, Margot Lee Shirley, writer, researcher, speaker, and entrepreneur. We are so, so proud to have you here, so honored that you could make it here. Thank you so much. So I spent quite a bit of time in aeroplanes, and uh, and that was a long time ago, and uh, lots of people told me, because I don't have time to go to the movies or watch TV here, they said, you have to, to watch one movie, and that's a Hidden Figures movie, because I've been involved with NASA for many years, served on their board there, and I'm on the board of the space station now, and I'm passionate about space exploration. And I watched the movie, and it was like fascinating. 
And, and then the book came after the movie. Normally the book comes before the movie, but in my life, books come after the movie. So, <laughs> and it was just fascinating. And it's a true story of the black women mathematicians at NASA who helped fuel some of the America's greatest achievements in space. The film adaptation of the book, which I saw, was released in January 2017 and won critical acclaim. And Marco is also the founder of the Human Computer Project, a digital archives of the stories of NASA's African-American human computers, whose work tipped, tipped the balance in favor of the US during World War II, the Cold War, the space race. And inspired by her father, who was among NASA's first black engineers and scientists, and I cannot wait to hear the story, Margo, I'm sitting next to you. Margo has uh, made it her life's work to celebrate those unsung heroes, teasing out issues of race, gender, science, and innovation against the backdrop of World War II and the civil rights movement. We are so proud to honor Margo, and we'll hear from her shortly, followed by a brief uh, audience Q&A. And now let's enjoy our food and we'll resume our program once dessert is served and bon appetit. I want to thank all of you for coming uh, tonight and uh, we really uh, have appreciated all the good conversations that have been happening at all these tables, so thank you. Um, my name is Gwil York and I serve as the chair of the Museum of Science. It's my great privilege to uh, be here tonight in front of all of you and really I'm looking forward to our our, our speaker tonight and our award recipient, so I'm very excited. So um, I'd like you to be, uh, uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for this wonderful evening and I wanna give a shout out to Priscilla, are you here? Juan? Okay, the two people that helped us get our wonderful um, uh, speaker tonight are not here, but we appreciate what, uh, their, uh, what they did for us, so can we give them a round of applause even though they won't know? So, um, at the Museum of Science, we honor those who push the boundaries and imagine what's possible. This award belongs to the dreamers, to the pioneers, to the women like you, Margot, who teach us that without imagination, there can be no progress. Margot, I'm honored to present you with the museum's highest honor, the Brad Washburn Award, which includes the Washburn Medal, an honorarium of $20,000, and this citation, which reads in part, prize-winning first-time author, founder of the Human Computer Project, passionate researcher, and a historian, you have opened a window to the gifted and valiant black women working as mathematicians at NASA's Project Mer Mercury. Your book honors and celebrates these brilliant women, these human computers, these hidden figures. You are the trailblazer shining a light on their life-saving diligence, their role in America's success in this historic endeavor, and their enduring strength in the face of racial and gender prejudice. Through your perseverance, your courage and commitment to revealing the truth, you weave together the Cold War, the space race, women's rights, the civil rights, into a compelling tale of mathematical genius and groundbreaking science. So Margot Lee Shetterly, we honor and salute your extraordinary contribution to society and to the public and understand and appreciate your appreciation of science and technology and I can't wait for your next book. <laughs> Thank you. So Gwil and Giannis, um, everybody who has been involved in bringing me here uh, 
and for selecting me as a recipient of this year's Bradford Washburn Award. Thank you. I am so humbled to join this esteemed group of previous recipients, and I am honored that you found my work to be in the spirit of Bradford Washburn, who is someone who believed that the understanding of and passion for science and technology and engineering belonged in the public square. And as, as I was preparing for tonight and learning more about Mr. Washburn, I was also pleased and really just so surprised to learn about his wife, Barbara Polk Washburn, and I know so many of you here tonight know about her. I didn't know about her. I didn't know that she was the first woman to climb Denali, the mountain in Alaska, which she did alongside her husband in 1947, um, and that she was also his partner in exceptional cartographic work. And together, the Washburns created landmark maps of the Grand Canyon and Mount Everest, and they were jointly awarded the National Geographic Society's Alexander Graham Bell Award in 1980. Now, that kind of partnership, going through life with a brilliant, lion-hearted individual who matches your curiosity and is game for every adventure, that is rare, and the people who have it are lucky, and I know because I am one of them. And my husband, Aaron Shetterly, who is my partner in everything, is here tonight at the table. <laughs> So I'm going to move this over here a little bit. Um, so on their honeymoon, the Washburns went to Alaska and they climbed Mount Bertha. On our honeymoon, Aaron and I bought a car, we drove to Mexico, and we started an English ma language magazine. So touche, Washburns. <laughs> Now, Aaron has been a part of this Hidden Figures adventure from the very beginning. He's also a writer who knows a good story, and in fact, he has the distinction of being the first person that I heard ask the question, why haven't I heard this story before? And he asked that question after hearing my father, who was a retired NASA Langley research scientist. Uh, my dad was talking about Katherine Johnson and the other female mathematicians whom he knew from work, and these are women that I knew as a little girl. Um, and that question, eight years ago now, that sparked a curiosity in me for the people and the events that I write about in my book, which happened in my hometown of Hampton, Virginia. Now, when people ask me about hidden figures, they want to know more about the story, but they also want to know the backstory. You know, they say, okay, there was a book, then there was a movie, and they kind of came out at the same time, and I don't really understand. So I thought I'd tell you a little about it. Um, Hidden Figures is my first book, and I am aware of just how lucky I am to have found a publisher. Then having this book made into a movie, that is so much more than I ever imagined possible when I started that journey back in 2010. What happened is I did the research, started research on the book in 2010. I, I did that research from 2010 through 2014, conducting interviews with, with Katherine Johnson and the family of Dorothy Vaughn and, and Mary Jackson, engineers that worked with them, uh, people at NASA, um, going through research reports and obituaries and anything that would show the circumstances that brought those women to NASA. And then when I'd made enough progress, uh, I found a literary agent who took me on and she sold the book proposal to Harper Collins. Then about a month after that, I got a call and someone named Donna Gelati. Now Donna Gelati was a film, propose, uh, film producer and somehow she had gotten hold of this proposal through this mysterious network of book scouts. These are people whose professional job it is to find books that might make a good movie. So Donna called me up, and this was in um, 2014. I was in Hampton at the time. I was doing interviews for Hidden Figures. And um, so she called on my cell phone. I pull over into the parking lot of the Food Lion supermarket. And <laughs> anyone who's ever been to Virginia knows there's a Food Lion supermarket on every single corner. So I pull into the parking lot, and she says to me on the phone, this is almost the first thing that she says to me, like barely introduction, we are going to make a movie of your book. <laughs> and this was just like in the movies. You know, I'm having this moment and I can't believe it. And, uh, you know, but I'm, I'm saying to her, well, you realize that I'm still writing the book. <laughs> and who are you? Why are you calling me? I don't understand what's happening. Well, you know, it does turn out that this Donna Gelati happens to be the Academy Award-winning producer of Silver Linings Playbook and Shakespeare in Love. 
and she is one of a very small cadre of women in Hollywood who are powerful enough to green light a film. And the news just came out a couple of days ago that Donna Gelati is going to be the producers of this year's Oscar telecast. That's the, yes, exactly. <laughs> that, that is the level that she operates at. So I sold her the option to my book, or my book in progress, I should say. And at that time, I didn't know if that was the best thing that happened to me or the worst thing. Because here I was, you know, I was a first-time author. I had never written a book before. Uh, I was learning how to write a book, and I was trying to finish this book ahead of this freight train of a movie production that Donna Gelati was moving forward at full steam. And so it, it would be one thing if I were writing a book about my life, you know, and I was exposing my life in details to public scrutiny. But I was, you know, making the decision to entrust the life stories of other people to these Hollywood people that I had just met. You know, other people who knew my parents, other people who I would run into in the Food Lion supermarket every time I went home to Hampton, Virginia, and they would certainly know where to find me if the movie turned out to be a disaster. So this entire experience was a crash course in what it takes to turn a literary property into a film. So Donna hired me as a consultant and I got an executive producer credit. And she and the screenwriter and the director of the movie went out of their way to solicit my input and keep me involved. But I was really nervous because at the end of the day, I didn't have any authority over the final cut of the movie or the final script. So I was pushing to finish my book, first time author, at the same time the script for the book that I was trying to finish was also being written. And every once in a while, I you know, look up at two o'clock in the morning trying to write this book, and I would get a draft in my inbox of the script in, in progress. <laughs> so now and again, I get Donna on the phone, and I would just totally freak out about some of the inventions in the script. <laughs> And I'd say, Donna, how can you show Dorothy Vaughn driving in the movie? She, if you've seen the movie, Dorothy is the one who carpools them to work. Dorothy Vaughn never learned how to drive. <laughs> I'd be like, Donna, how can you show this Al Harrison character, you know, this composite head of NASA? How can you show, and he's played by Kevin Costner, you show him sledgehammering the colored bathroom sign in the movie. Sorry, spoiler alert for you guys who haven't seen it. <laughs> And, you know, and then this is, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm reading the script, and I'm, there's a line in the script that is, at NASA, after he sledgehammers the sign, at NASA we all pee the same color. And I'm thinking, like, oh, my goodness, this is, I'm thinking about my parents and Katherine Johnson, they're going to see this movie, this line, and I'm sort of scandalized a little bit. Anyway, so Aaron and I saw an early rough cut of the final film during the fall of 2016, and this, this cut of the movie didn't have music yet. And to be honest, I, I was a little underwhelmed. I felt like, okay, well, it's okay, and, you know, very lukewarm. Then they told me that prior to the official launch in theaters, the producers were going to schedule the very first official showing of the movie, the fully edited final cut, in Hampton, Virginia for the ha hometown crowd. And the thing is, I was not going to be able to make the event. <laughs> so Katherine Johnson and her family were gonna be there. The families of Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson were going to be there. Uh, all of the NASA mathematicians and engineers who had worked with these women and who lived this history, they were all gonna be there. The administrator of NASA and all of the NASA muckety-mucks were going to be there. I was not going to be there. You know, my parents were going to be there. And so I was far away and anxious that entire evening and just wondering how Hidden Figures' big debut was going to play in Hampton, Virginia. So I call my mother the next day, you know, just like wondering what is she going to say about this movie, and I ask her, what did you think about the movie? And then she starts raving. She's like, oh, it was such a great movie. This was awesome. And I'm like, well, what about Dorothy Vaughn driving? Dorothy Vaughn never learned how to drive. You know, what about Kevin Costner and the sledgehammer? And, you know, at NASA, we all pee the same color, <laughs> you know? And she's like, no, 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 we loved it. You know, even that line, she's like, you know, that scene and that line was about, uh, we're all the same. You know, there are all these differences, and it, it was sort of a, 
you know, a, a, a corny, if you will, way of saying it. But it's like, you know, that's about us all being the same. We loved it. You know, and Katherine Johnson and her family loved it. And, you know, everyone was laughing and they were talking at the screen and they were crying. And then she tells me at the end, you know, there's the real women's photographs appear on the screen. And she said, we all just stood up and we started clapping and screaming and laughing and jumping up and down. And, you know, the narrative dream of the movie, it was so complete and so real that my mother on the telephone, she even asked me, was this movie filmed in Katherine Johnson's house? And she spent a lot of time in Katherine Johnson's house. <laughs> so I finally saw the theatrical version of the movie at a screening in New York about two weeks after that. And ironically, it was the day after John Glenn died, which really made it all the more poignant. And it was actually that day that he died, I was here in Cambridge um, with Aaron and with our uncle Jay and Blair. We were all together that day here and uh, doing press for the movie. So I didn't see it until the next day in New York. And what I learned when I saw the full movie the next day is that there's no way to transform a book into a movie, at least not into an entertaining, good movie, without taking dramatic license and creating some composite characters and conflating the timelines. And from the opening scenes to the end credits of the movie, I watched it as if I had never heard the name Dorothy Vaughn, or Katherine Johnson, or Mary Jackson. And I was sitting on the edge of my seat, just like everyone else. And I was wondering, well, is Katherine going to finish those calculations? <laughs> is she going to say yes to Jim Johnson's marriage proposal? <laughs> and is John Glenn going to make it home safely back to the earth? And I loved it just as much as everyone else. I was completely captivated by the storytelling. Now, since then, I can't even tell you how many times I've seen the movie. I've seen it with the cast and the Hollywood people at the premieres, and I've seen it with a theater full of black women in Hampton, Virginia. I've seen it with NASA people and politicians on Capitol Hill, including Virginia Senators Tim Kaine and Mark Warner. I've seen it in my local theater in Charlottesville, Virginia, and I just watched it a couple of weeks ago on an airplane coming back from California. <laughs> I have seen this movie with moviegoers of every conceivable age, gender, race, ethnicity, class, professional background, and political persuasion, and the reaction, that laughing and the crying and the cheering it's been the same each time. And, and what's funny is every single time that I've seen the movie, including on the airplane two weeks ago, I have loved it more. And I've seen all the historical documents, and I have interviewed the real people. I grew up knowing these women. I know what's fact, and I know what's been fictionalized. And each time I see it, I've been taken aback by how much I needed that story. Not just the history, but the story. The story, though, it did have to start with the history, and that meant starting with the facts. What happened, who did it, where and when and how. And I love this research. If I didn't have a book to deliver, I would probably still be researching this story. And from the beginning of working on this book, I knew that even though I would write this as narrative nonfiction, which is to say, telling a story using the kind of style and voice and characterization that you might find in fiction, that this book had to be as meticulously documented as a specification manual for the Mercury capsule. So I wasn't a trained historian. I probably read and analyzed 10 times more material than actually made it into the book, just so that I could satisfy myself that I understood the history. And I'm not an engineer or a scientist myself, so I knew that I would have to go out of my way to get the science and the engineering right. And I spent so many late nights, too many to count, poring over mathematics textbooks and NASA research reports and trying to make sense of the mechanics of the work that these women were actually doing. Furthermore, I was always aware that it would be hard for some people to imagine a world in which the words black and female and mathematician could apply to just one person as opposed to three separate individuals. So to the 279 pages of text of the book, I added 55 pages of notes and references. Because for my purpose writing this book, it was always really clear. The facts, the truth, and the story had to be one and the same. But when I was watching my book being adapted for the screenplay, 
And uh, th that really gave me a deeper and a much more subtle understanding of those concepts and the relationship between those things. So I have always been a facts kind of person, and I'm assuming that most of the people in this room, that you guys are probably also facts kind of people. <laughs> Um, you know, and I never really stopped to consider that there might be a difference between a factual story and a true story. And you know, this is pre-2016 when we got different concepts of facts. But in the film world, fact and truth and story have a more elastic relationship. And there are different legal standards based on how closely the film version of a story adheres to the book and to the underlying history. So based on a true story, for example, is a stricter standard than inspired by true events. So at the beginning of this process, I said to the movie producers and the screenwriters, listen, my whole book is true. It starts in 1943, it ends in 1969, I think the movie should start in 1943, and I think it should end in 1969. <laughs> and fortunately, they did not listen to me because you would, <laughs> you would all still be sitting in the theater watching the movie. <laughs> they made a very smart decision to focus the movie's narrative on Katherine Johnson's work calculating the, tra the trajectory of John Glenn's 1962 orbital space flight. And as I mentioned before, that meant making changes for the sake of a coherent narrative. For example, if you've read the book, you know that the fact is Katherine Johnson never went to the colored bathroom in real life. The center was huge and the number of black employees as a percentage was small, so there wasn't a need for there to be a black bathroom in every single building, and there was not one near Katherine's building. And furthermore, Katherine Johnson, she told, she's told this to me, she said this in other interviews, you know, she just refused to even look for the bathroom. She, she went to the, the bathroom. It was, de facto the white bathroom, she's like, I'm not even going to entertain this idea, and she dared anyone to tell her otherwise. Now in real life, this was Mary Jackson. Mary Jackson had an incident where she had to run all the way across campus to find the colored bathroom, but Katherine Johnson was the movie's main protagonist, and so it was Katherine who got this very dramatic narrative in the retelling. Now, despite that change, the movie depicts an essential truth. Most of the black employees, particularly in the early days of World War II, had to use the segregated bathrooms, not just at work, but at the bus station and at the train station and at every other public place in Virginia, assuming that they were allowed inside at all. Brilliance and hard work were simply not enough to exempt people from the segregation that persisted in our country for centuries. And most people who are over a certain age who lived at that time in our country are familiar with the facts of segregation, but they might not have been familiar with the truth of it, which is that it was experienced by people who were real and proud and vulnerable and human as all of us are. And the power of story is by seeing the segregation applied to Catherine and these other women that we see as heroines in that movie, it feels like it is happening to us right there in the movie theater. And that feeling creates empathy for others. And creating empathy, that is the power of story. And here's another example. As I mentioned before, the scene where Al Harrison gets so fed up with Catherine's prolonged absences that, to run to the colored bathroom, that he takes this sledgehammer to the colored bathroom sign. That was created just for the screenplay. Now, the facts are that in 1958, the head of NASA, the NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia, dispatched the remaining black women of the West Area Computing Group to different engineering groups, and that ended not just racial segregation at the center, but also the last vestige of the all-female computer groups there. Now, this happened four years before what's shown in the movie. And I tried to convince the producers that this was a really, really fascinating memo, um, but they decided it was a little bit too subtle, so they decided to use a sledgehammer instead. <laughs> Now, the truth is that gender and racial segregation at the center had been declining for years before the Langley director penned that particular memo. So the engineers took note of the talent of the women at Langley's West Area computer, what, uh, Computing Area, and what they did is they began to offer them permanent positions in the different engineering groups and the different wind tunnels. And that was the same thing that had happened, pretty much started a decade earlier, with the white women uh, who were working in the East Area Computing Office. And the times were changing in the country. You know, our country was moving grudgingly but surely away from an era 
where our system of racial apartheid was law in the South and practice pretty much everywhere else. And it was moving away from a time when women accepted being paid less for doing the same work without protest. And the truth is, it was the commitment to excellence on the part of these women themselves and the actions of multitudes of people inside NASA and across the country that laid the groundwork for that memo. And we'd also like to think that removing segregation at NASA was purely a matter of principle and that people were motivated strictly by doing the right thing. But it's also true that it was politically expedient. So America's Cold War with the Soviet Union coincided with a full-blown domestic crisis over race here in our country. And the Russians played America's turmoil and internal divisiveness to their advantage every chance they got. They chided the United States for the hypocrisy of promising democracy ab abroad while denying basic civil rights to 10% of its own population. Now, NASA's predecessor agency, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, was an obscure little organization that worked on airplanes. and Nobody really knew where it was or what it did. Um, but the West Area Computing Memo was published just as quiet little NACA was transformed into agency, this, uh, NASA, and this is an agency that was very high profile, it was on television, and it was on the leading edge of the conflict with the Soviet Union. So continuing racial segregation in an organization purporting to be the model of American meritocracy would have left the Russians with a powerful propaganda tool. Now, for those of you who have seen the film but haven't read the book, I'm sure there's another question bobbing around your mind. So toward the end of the movie, as astronaut John Glenn is on the launch pad and he is getting ready to leave for a space flight, the IBM computer spits out different numbers for the trajectory equations than it had the day before. So John Glenn is about to strap himself into a metal can, which we have a replica of right here. <laughs> so just imagine putting yourself into that metal can and then you are going to be blasted off on a ballistic missile. So obviously astronaut John Glenn had a vested interest in making sure the numbers were correct. So what he does in the movie is he asks the Kevin Costner character, Al Harrison, for one more safeguard. He says, get the girl to check the numbers. And what John Glenn wants is for Katherine Johnson to do a complete hand check of the equations that have been programmed into the computer and compare her output with the computer's output so they know what the numbers should be. Now, this is the most dramatic scene of the movie. And if you think about it, it's really what the whole movie is about. It might be segregated Hampton, Virginia in 1962, but NASA has decided that a black female mathematician is the right person at the right time for the job at hand. Get the girl to check the numbers. But in real life, well, <laughs> in real life, what is true is that John Glenn did say, he did ask, get the girl to check the numbers. That is absolutely true. So with the launch approaching, John Glenn asked the engineers of the trajectory analysis group there at, at Langley Research Center to get their human computer, who was Katherine Johnson, um, he didn't know her name, he knew who she was and the work she did, but didn't know her name. He said, get the girl, Katherine Johnson, to double check the electronic computer's output. And that made sense because Katherine Johnson did indeed, as is depicted in the movie, co-author the research report laying out the conceptual basis for orbital flight, detailing all of the equations that would form the basis for the IBM computer program. Now, I will concede it is also a fact that NASA did not have Katherine Johnson crunching those numbers on the launch pad as the mission was about to happen. <laughs> and I think we can all agree that the people at NASA are a little bit more organized than that. <laughs> She actually checked the numbers in her office at the Langley Research Center a few days before John Glenn blasted off on February 20th, 1962. And it's also clearly the case that nothing so complex as a space mission is ever dependent on the work of just one person, no matter how brilliant. Katherine Johnson worked alongside women and men of all backgrounds, and together they pulled off an achievement that was the turning point in Americans' competition with the Russians in the space race. Now the truth of the matter, the truth of all of that, is that Katherine Johnson was so absorbed by her passion for math 
that she will tell everyone who asks that she loved every single day of her career at NASA, despite all the hard things, every single day. And Katherine Johnson knows how to count, so when she says every single day, I know she means every single day. <laughs> The truth of the matter is that the black women of West Computing gave their all to America's pursuit of democracy abroad and in the heavens, even as America de denied them that democracy here at home. The truth is that years before the space race, the black women of West Computing, the white women of East Computing, women of all backgrounds were crunching numbers to make airplanes faster, safer, and more efficient, and history looked right past them. The truth is that during the 19th and the 20th centuries, women worked as mathematicians and computers at all of the NACA and NASA centers, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, and Natalia Holt, who lives here in Cambridge, wrote an excellent book called Rise of the Rocket Girls about those women. Women mathematicians worked at the Army Ballistic Research Laboratory and at the Naval Research Laboratory. They worked at Bell Labs and Northrop Grumman and so many other private companies. And they worked at universities, such as Harvard's Astronomical Research Laboratory. And those Harvard women's work was detailed in Deva Sabel's book, The Glass Universe. And Deva was a 2001 Washburn Medal recipient. And so I am very honored to share that with her. It's an outstanding book. The truth is that women sitting in rooms doing math have powered so much of the scientific and technological advances of the modern era. So we hear John Glenn say, get the girl to do it. It's this powerful convergence of truth and fact and story. Or to borrow an astronomical term, it's a syzygy, which is defined as the nearly straight line configuration of three celestial bodies. And that is the reason why Katherine Johnson and the NASA folks and my parents and the people back in Hampton, Virginia, who knew the history, they loved the movie, even if some of the facts were changed, because the movie is true. And truth is more than just a sequence of facts. Truth, truth captures something larger about the way we see and understand the world. And people who love facts usually love science too and engineering, but it's critically important that those of us who love facts and who love science and believe that science is both factual and true it's important for us to remember that science, too, is a story. It's a story about the physical world and our place in it. Before we split the atom, before we broke the sound barrier, before we landed humans on the moon, we needed the imagination to conceive that those things might be possible. Inspiring people through the story of science was clearly part of Mr. Washburn's mission. And walking around the museum today, it's, it's such a delight to be here because that is still alive in this building. Writing and researching hidden figures and participating in the production of that movie, it really helped me to understand in a visceral way which each of us knows intuitively. That is, facts alone are not enough to kindle the human imagination. Facts alone are not enough to create empathy. Facts alone are not enough to get people to make common cause with others and sacrifice for something greater than themselves. Something like taking the urgent measures that are needed to mitigate the impact of climate change and save the only home our, only, our species has ever known. Facts, when combined with story, can reveal truth, not just about our world as it was or our world as it is, but the world as it might be. The best stories keep hope alive they steer us away from the abyss, and they encourage us to work so that tomorrow will be better than today. And I think Hidden Figures does that. While acknowledging some of the most difficult facts of our country's history, it shows what's possible when we give talented people a chance to shine, no matter who they are or where they're from. These women and their stories show us that even in fractured times like these, when so many of us see ourselves as incompatibly different from our neighbors and our colleagues and our fellow citizens, and when facts are contested as a matter of opinion, that there is still room for shared truth, and we have to fight to find the shared truth. If the story is powerful enough, we will be able to see things the same way. Thank you very much. Well, this was 
fabulous. This is like what the Washburn Award was supposed to be. And we have a few minutes for questions. So, and we'll have a microphone going around. Let's see, where is my colleague with the mic? Okay, so please. So thank you for that. That was a great presentation, very awe-inspiring. I can't help myself. I have to know where you were that you couldn't be there for the premiere of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was actually, um, I was in Texas A&M doing a speech. And um, it's, if you've ever been to College Station, Texas, I mean, I looked at the, the uh, you know, the, the schedules, there, there simply was not a, po I mean, if I had flown on the space shuttle, maybe I could have gotten back home. But um, yeah, it, was, it wasn't possible. So in a way, it was really great because hearing it from my parents and hearing it from everyone else um, and then getting to see it, 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 it meant, you know, it was great. It was, it was really wonderful. So yes. <laughs> Uh, so the, the next book, I'm, I just started working on a new project. Um, the, the thing that was so wonderful about doing this research for Hidden Figures is that I got to see, just learn about so many interesting people and um, who, you know, I was asking constantly, well, why haven't I heard that story before? I didn't, why didn't I know about that person? And um, the thing that was, that was also really clear from Hidden Figures became clear to me is this idea of work and work identity and you know this whole intersection of social mobility and race and you know all of that gender all of that was just really the american dream you know what does it mean to be american all of that is just so interesting to me it's always been interesting to me as a you know an individual and so to express that as a writer is something that was really enjoyable so the next book uh, is based on uh, characters that i learned about doing the research for hidden figures um, and they're African Americans also in that time period from the 30s through the 70s, you know, that peak of the American century, which is, you know, a fascinating time period to me. Um, and these are entrepreneurs as opposed to scientists. Um, so I grew up with, with, you know, a scientist and the NASA people, but I spent a lot of my career, most of my career as um, a business person and an entrepreneur. So in a way, this is closer to what I've actually done um, as a professional. And I'm just getting into the, the research of that book. So how did the NASA people, when you approached them to, about the book, how did, they, how did they take your approach about what you wanted to do? You know, the NASA people from the very beginning have been amazing. Every single person at NASA was supportive of, of writing this book. I mean, they opened all of their archives to me. Um, anyone that I wanted to talk to or interview about, uh, you know, any of this history, they, they made it happen. Um, they provided me with photos and um, wind tunnel test videos and, you know, uh, particularly the woman who was the historian at the Langley Research Center who retired two years ago, um, a woman named Mary Gaynor Hurst. She was phenomenal. And if you go to the Langley Research Center website, there is so much information. I mean, there are phone books. And so, for example, I knew who was sitting at the desk with Katherine Johnson because I could go through the digitized phone books, search for her name, find her extension, and find out who else shared that extension? You know, I mean, there was so much primary source material that NASA had made available um, that it, it really made it, you know, it, the challenge was really wading through all of that primary source material, all of the research reports. Um, but NASA has been phenomenally supportive of this book from day one. So I, I want to appreciate your story as well. Um, but. You just talked about your, what will be your second period piece. And I've been in education my whole career. And I have uh, an understanding of what young 
um, black students, men and women, um, what their values are now. And there's something about the generations that you have looked at in these two works that is intriguing. And I'm wondering if you can say something about the degree to which progress is recovery. That is to say, I think there may be something that we have lost. There's something that made those women and hidden figures who they are. And we don't see as much of that in a lot of places now. And I think that may explain why maybe fewer uh, women or without the same intensity, young black women and young black men are going into the STEM fields as much as they could and should. So do you have any perspective on the degree to which progress is recovery and what we might be able to recover that you see in that era? Oh, I can, I can certainly tell you um, what I found in my research. Um, and so all of the, the black women, all of the black women um, who, I, you know, who I wrote about and who I researched, went to historically black colleges. All of the white women, with a very few exceptions, went to women's colleges. They went to Sweetbriar and um, you know, the New Jersey College for Women, which is now part of Rutgers and Smith. And so because they were not allowed at Harvard and at MIT and at Georgia Tech and you know, all of these other schools, they were, and, and were not allowed not just to attend, but to teach. They were concentrated at these other schools, which had, for example, Katherine Johnson went to uh, what was called West Virginia State Institutes, now West Virginia State University, um, historically black college. Her mentor was a guy named W.W. W. Shefflin Clater, who was the third African American PhD in math in the country, considered brilliant. You know, his PhD thesis was, you know, reading about this amazing, in the field of topology, considered absolutely you know, groundbreaking. He was not allowed to teach at Yale or Penn or any of these schools, so he took a job there, and he, Katherine Johnson had direct access to this brilliant mathematician that she might not have had access to had she gone to a, a larger school or a, a predominantly white school or, you know, so the talent was really concentrated in those schools for that generation of African Americans and for women, you know, at these other women's colleges where they could not teach at MIT's and Harvard. So when I interviewed those women and, you know, not just the black women, all of the women, they talk about the superb educations that they, real, that they got at these schools and how they felt extremely competitive um, despite the perception that their educations were less because they were segregated either by gender or race. Um, they, they had superb educations and felt extremely competitive coming into those schools. So the, the circumstances really, um, I think that concentration of talent um, made it possible for them to come in and to, to be very competitive and to be, uh, you know, to have the careers that they had. But, you know, on the other hand, um, they were not allowed to, or they did not move up that generation as in the same way and have the same uh, uh, accessibility that I had as a professional. I went to the University of Virginia. Um, they did not have the expectations. They were not able to move into management. I mean, so there, you know, there, it, it's, there are a lot of things that they did have, I think. There are a lot of things that, that were traded off um, for my generation and for subsequent generations. So I don't know the answer to that, but I, I think that conversation is, is really a fascinating conversation. But I can tell you that, um, you know, when I, growing up, for example, my dad talked about all of these women as being really brilliant. And he would say to me, listen, she was the number one person in her class. She was a class valedictorian. You know, she was doing groundbreaking research as a junior in college. So. Um, you know, these women came in, they established their credibility, and the men that they worked with had the highest respect for them. Hi. Um, <clears throat> so for uh, sharing your story and for all of your amazing words tonight. I had a question regarding um, Ms. Katherine Johnson's response. 
when she learned that you were writing the story? What was her, what, what was her response? Uh, well, first of all, Katherine Johnson just turned 100 years old. She still lives um, in Newport News, Virginia. She is still married to her husband, Jim, that she married in the film. Um, <laughs> and uh, last year, NASA Langley Research Center named a building, a computational facility after her, which was pretty amazing. Uh, Katherine Johnson's response, and then I would say is, is representative of the response of most of these women, you know, more broadly, when asked uh, about their career, about, you know, how do they feel, you know, being, breaking barriers, you know, you know, all of these questions that I think reflect the perceptions that we have today. Um, how did you feel knowing that you were, you know, that you were doing something, putting a man on the moon and you were the only woman and you're only African-American woman? And she will say absolutely every single time when you ask that question, it was very exciting. I always did my best work, but I was just doing my job. Um, and I think the expectation was that you always did your job, you always did your best, but you didn't have the expectation that, um, that you, well, one, you didn't go home and talk about the work, um, particularly during World War II and the Cold War, um, because a lot of that was classified and, and you just didn't do that. Um, but it, it was, there was a, I think the expectation, you know, really these women thought that they were going to be school teachers. That was the expectation for a woman who was good at math with a math degree. When these other jobs opened up at NASA, it was just an entire, new concept, the idea that you could be a professional mathematician and working on something as cool as airplanes and the space race, you know, that was really amazing. It was so much more than they had expected when they came into that job. Um, and they loved it. You know, they were getting the chance to do absolutely what they were good at and what they loved. So the idea that they would um, expect more than that, you know, it was really hard for me, I think, with growing up in my generation with my expectations to, to feel like, well, you know, don't you think they should have said something about all this amazing work that you were doing a long time ago, which we believe now? And all of the women say, well, you know, we were, we were just doing our jobs. At the same time, I think that they're really excited that people are asking the questions and they're asking them about what they did in 1945 and 55 and 65 and that people are saying thank you and saying, you know, I wanna be like you when I grow up. So that, that part of it, I think, makes Katherine Johnson smile. And the fact that people are really enthused about science and math because she loves science and math. And um, even before she retired, particularly after she retired, and you know, now she's a little bit too frail, but she spent a lot of time talking with kids about the value at science education and, why engineering was really exciting and, you know, talking about her career. So I, I think it's been kind of cool for, you know, for her and for, for their families. Christine Darden, so Christine Darden is in the book. She's not in the movie. She's actually the generation. She's like my father's generation. Um, she's now also retired, but she travels and speaks more than I do. I mean, she is a pioneering uh, aerospace engineer whose field is sonic boom minimization, and she is also an absolutely intrepid advocate for science education. So I think that they also see it as an, this is an opportunity to get kids excited, which is what they've been doing for, trying to do for 50 years. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this was just fabulous. And that's what the Washburn Award, like I said, is, is all about. And uh, as far as numbers are concerned, uh, uh, now you, some of you may be wondering how come uh, hand calculations could, could do all these sort of space things. Do you know how many uh, uh, megabytes each picture you take with your iPhone or Android has about each picture? It's about what? Nobody knows, my God, this is a museum of science, you know? <laughs> like megabytes, okay? Megabytes. Do you know how, how much the... Megabytes. megabytes, yeah. Do you know how many gigabytes, megabytes, whatever, the whole Apollo 
spacecraft that made it to the moon had as a computing system? 64K. So you could do things by hand and, and bring people to the moon. And, 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 and right now we're so accustomed to these amazing devices we have, but human brains and human talent like these wonderful women had can bring people to, to the space and, and uh, take off and land, uh, land uh, safely. The other number I want to run by you is that uh, if you look at women graduates from elite universities like Harvard, MIT, Tufts, and others, uh, and you look at women graduates from women colleges like Smith College and Wesley College, uh, twice as many women that major in the sciences in the women's colleges go for PhDs. So there's still, even these days, there's still a big value on, on, uh, on single uh, gender education. And, and these colleges like Wesley and Smith and others still generate women, women leaders. Uh, so this was a fabulous night. I want to thank you all for coming. And of course, I want to advertise our next event, which is our Women and Girls in STEM uh, month. Uh, and uh, of course, we're going to have a Women in Science and Engineering luncheon on November 9th, and there are still some tickets available. Normally, men are not invited, but Ellie, are men invited on this one? Okay, well, this is an exception. Men are invited, maybe. It's usually a fabulous event. So, good night. Thank you for coming. Thank you.